Um, over the last uh, weeks, we have been praying for Bonnie Snyder, and uh, Bob and Bonnie are here this morning. I've just asked Bonnie if she'd like to say something, and she says she would, uh, which is out of character for her, <laughs> but I did want her to give her that opportunity. Bonnie, would you come? Let's uh, welcome Bonnie this morning. You look good. Thank you. Thanks. You've been through quite a journey. Yes, it is so good to be here. I decided I would never not speak. God has been so good. And you have been so faithful. I, I don't know many of you that are praying. I know, I know many that are. And uh, Bob and I grew up in this church on Elmer Street. And uh, it was always a praying church. And we, we loved that church. And, and uh, you have loved me back. Um, I'm doing well. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> um, five weeks in the hospital and then two weeks straight of outpatient going every day and right now I feel blessed to be once a week and uh, I go for treatments every Tuesday and um, and I live with symptoms every day but I am getting stronger and doing more I um, I've got my sewing machine out for Christmas mm. stuff and and uh, making uh, you're just doing different things and, and getting out and being with friends again. Um, so I, I just, you need to know that you're part of my journey. You're, you're praying and it's, and it's your faithfulness. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm humbled by it. I really am. I've been more the prayer warrior and to take it from people. I, there hasn't been a moment I haven't felt carried in prayer. Mm -hmm. So yeah. thank you all. Bonnie, Very how, much. Uh, tell us the treatment plan. Where, oh, where's this heading? Um, I'm every week for 30 weeks. Um, every three weeks is a is a drip, a chemo drip, as well as shots. Every then for, for two weeks it's the shots. So it's chemo all the time. I feel chemo running all the mm. time through me. But it is I'm in remission, and it is what's going to continue to heal and carry me through. And then around after 30 weeks, which is I think the end of April, um, I go every three weeks. And we have a wedding in July. Mm -hmm. My daughter's getting married in July, mm -hmm. and uh, so I'm ready to party then. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so... Um, Everyone, let's just stand and uh, surround Bonnie. We're going to pray for her right oh, now. Thank you. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for Bonnie, for her family, for her husband Bob, for her parents and for her siblings who have uh, really um, come... Mm -hmm together in such beautiful, beautiful ways, in, in ways that they never would have wanted or anticipated, but they have. And we just pray, Father, today that your divine healing hand would continue to be upon Bonnie. We thank you for how beautiful she has, uh, has, has continued to be as a person, as a believer in you. It, it just seems like this has deepened her. Mm -hmm. And we just ask, Father, that you would continue to bless her, uh, again, we ask for our kids yeah. and know that this is a, a trauma that they never would have anticipated either and ask that you would just protect them and keep them in the shelter of your hand. We pray, Father, that their, that their uh, desire would be for, that they would be, they would be drawn more and more to you as a result of cancer, not the other way around. We just pray, Father, that you again would help Bonnie to know that she's loved and that your hand is on her life and that this is the beginning of a chapter, not the end. Yeah. We give you thanks and we just pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would be divinely at work in her body today. Mm -hmm. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Psalm 118 in the Pew Bible. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his love endures forever. In my anguish, I cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. 
They swarmed around me like bees, but they died out as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O, o Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join the festival procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Thanks be to God.
stripped away and I simply Both this Sunday and next Sunday, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to link two passages uh, that are kind of the same theme that are connected to each other and uh, try and develop the ideas that both of those passages are, are talking about. So the first one is in Luke chapter 13, verses 31 to 35, page 1033 in your pew Bible. Kind of an interesting interchange that Jesus has uh, with the Pharisees. And then Luke 19, if you put your finger just uh, seven pages later in page 1040 in your pew Bible, uh, three verses that uh, come out of the triumphal entry. And again, I think you'll see the link that uh, the two have as we develop this together. This is uh, Luke 13 at verse 31. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then over to Luke 19, 41 to 44. I want to pick up what we read in the scripture reading, the 118th Psalm, 
is quoted in verse 38. So I'm going to pick it up at verse 38 and then take it to 44. This is a quote from the 118th Psalm in verse 38 of Luke 19. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when, you will, when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus, this morning, may this not be said of us. May we see what you're doing and join you in your work. We ask in your name, amen. Throughout the course of recorded history, one city has stood alone as the center of controversy and conflict. That city, of course, is Jerusalem. Even in the third and final U.S. presidential debate, which took place on Monday night past, the issue of American support for Israel and its people was a significant topic. So it is not surprising at all that while here on earth, our Lord Jesus Christ had great interest in this ancient city. The city of Jerusalem was the capital of Israel by the reign of King David around 1000 BC. David's son Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, completed the building of the temple, which was the center of worship in the Solomonic era by 940 BC. Solomon's temple and the city of Jerusalem were destroyed by the Babylonians. Again, what's new? Again, the same general people groups are in that same part of the, of the Middle East today. Destroyed by the Babylonians and their famous general Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. So Solomon's temple basically stood for 400 years, give or take. Until the reign of Herod, Herod the Great, who lived from 73 B.C. to 4 A.D., just before the birth of Jesus. The second temple in Jerusalem was nowhere near the beauty of Solomon's temple. Herod took it on as his pet project. It began in, in around 20 B.C. He died in 4 A.D. Herod's temple was not completed until 64 A.D. And then, six years later, in fulfillment of the prophecy of Luke chapter 19, Jerusalem goes down again, this time to the Romans and the Roman general Titus, who absolutely destroyed it, leaving it nothing but a smoldering mound of ruins and debris in 70 AD. So Herod's temple in its finished form lasted only six years. Although today Jerusalem is rebuilt as a modern city, the temple has not been rebuilt. All that is left of the second temple, Herod's temple, is the western wall, or what is often called in the media, the Wailing Wall. Now, of course, those of you who know your Jerusalem story know that on the site, on that site of Herod's, Solomon's temple, Herod's temple, today sits the mosque, the Dome of the Rock. So with this historical backdrop in mind, I want us to look at these two passages of Scripture that record Jesus' interaction with the city of Jerusalem. First is the Luke 13 passage, although I do want to also connect it to the uh, Luke 19 passages, so we'll go back and forth between the two. The Luke 13 passage is just a few weeks before Jesus' crucifixion. We know historically, that he's walking towards Jerusalem for what will be the final time. It's interesting that the Pharisees come to Jesus and say to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you because the Pharisees were part of the group that wanted to kill Jesus. So there is some thought that they may in fact have been emissaries of Herod, that they were trying to set Jesus up. 
They may have been agents of Herod. They certainly were not buddy-buddy with Jesus. So this connection that they have that looks like it might be a substantial protection kind of connection uh, probably is not. So they say, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. You notice how Jesus responds. Go tell that fox. He's talking about Herod as the fox. I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day. For surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. This, again, is part of Jerusalem's history that Jesus is talking about. The fact that Jerusalem is the scene for most of the major crises, tragedies having to do with the prophets of Israel in Israel's history. And then he goes into this, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to bring you under my wing, which is what that really means. But you were not willing. Look, your house is left for you desolate. Now, some think that the house there he's talking about is the temple. It's more likely that it's a wider term, that he's talking about the city of Jerusalem itself. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is a direct quote from the 118th Psalm, which we read together today, verse 26, which shows up again in Luke chapter 19. Now to Luke 19. Again, just looking at some of the major ideas here. It's right in the middle of the triumphal entry. So Jesus has made it to Jerusalem. Luke 13, he's not there yet. He's on his way. Luke 19, he's coming in. He's on the back of a donkey. Now, what is absolutely intriguing here is that on his way into the city, we're told that Jesus wept. He says, if only you knew what would bring you peace. The peace that you want, Jerusalem, it's right here. But you don't want it. So, he says, there will be a consequence. The days will come when an embankment will take place. When Titus, the Roman general, he doesn't name Titus, of course, but we know historically that what Jesus described is exactly what Titus did. He just built siege works up around the city of Jerusalem. He just stayed there and starved them out. All the, the modern artillery of the first century was just parked around the city of Jerusalem. And finally, he said, let's go. They're weak. And in Roman, in Titus went and destroyed, absolutely destroyed. Verse 44, Jesus says, they will not leave one stone on another. Again, an exact description of what would take place. If you date triumphal entry 28 AD then, and, and Titus 70 AD, there you are. Forty years later, Jesus' word has come true. Because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Okay, those are the two verses, two passages of Scripture. I'd like to make three observations now about these two passages. Here's the first. I've called it, Jesus wept. Uh, Jim Crozier was uh, one of the kids growing up in the Renfrew Church in the 1960s. Uh, I saw him when we were there on June the 10th. Uh, he wasn't at the uh, service at Parkview Free Methodist Church that Sunday morning, but he was at the, the Rosebank Cemetery decoration service that afternoon and, and got reconnected with him. Well, my Jim Crozier memory is this. Jim Crozier did not like school. He did not like CYC. He did not like anything having to do with memory work or Sunday school class. Uh, some of you who have taught Sunday school are already thinking of the kids that uh, were very similar to Jim Crozier. So anyway, the assignment was to memorize a verse of Scripture and to bring it back. Now, I have no idea what the context of all that was, but all I can remember is Jim Crozier standing to his feet and saying, Jesus wept. <laughs> it is a verse of Scripture, and it is only two verses. It's actually the shortest verse in the Bible. 
Now, what is intriguing about this to me is not what Jim Crozier did, but it is this. There are only two times in Holy Scripture that we are told that Jesus wept. The first one, remember? Lazarus. At the tomb of his friend Lazarus. I read it in this morning. It's amazing the depth of what Jesus felt in the face of human death. The second, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Now, Leon Morris in his commentary says that this isn't weeping. This is wailing. He absolutely sobbed. Why? Well, it is tied up in the meaning of the word Jerusalem. What does Jerusalem mean? I uh, ran a Google search on it, and there's all kinds of information online about the, the meaning and the history of Jerusalem. Uh, some of the uh, Jewish commentators are saying that it actually means reign of peace, not R-E-I-G-H-N, but R-A-I-N, like the rain that we're having these days that uh, Hurricane Sandy is touching our world. In other words, rain like peace, raining peace. Historically, it's been more commonly understood to be city of peace because Salem, the word Salem means peace the last five uh, letters of the name. If you had only known what, what does Jesus say? What would bring you peace? Jerusalem, city of peace, if you had only known what brings peace. And he cries. He wails because they missed the cue. Jesus weeps over lost opportunities in our lives, too. I'm convinced that what breaks the heart of Jesus is when we reject his offer to bring peace into our lives. Twice the scriptures say he wept. The first in the face of death, the second over Jerusalem's failure to see who he was. Second observation. It's tied up in this idea that he gives to the Pharisees when they're to go back to Herod. Tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. Now, does that sound at all like it might have some meaning other than just what he says to the Pharisees to go tell Herod? Absolutely. Without doubt, Jesus is foreshadowing his resurrection. The third day, it's in his mind already. Even on the road to Jerusalem, Jesus is focused on his mission. In fact, he's been focused on his mission since the beginning of his life. Just as a child, he's in the temple in Jerusalem, and Mary and Joseph head back for Nazareth in Galilee, and guess what? Jesus isn't with them. Where do they find him? In the temple teaching. What does he say to his parents? I must be about my father's business. He's 12 years old. And then later on, as he works with the concepts of the kingdom of God and his purpose and his mission, he says to his disciples, didn't you know the son of man came to seek and to save the lost? That's what I'm here for. In a word, Jesus is goal driven and his goal is to die. And he says no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. So he even knows where he's going to die. But there's another part to this story. And, and that's the good news part of it. The bad news is the death part. The good news is that on the third day, I will reach my goal. Revised Standard Version says, I will finish my course. Even Jesus had a course. Not an academic course, but a course for his life. Jesus has a goal for you, too, to live with him eternally. But even before that time, before 
we come to that place where death comes for us. He's got a goal for our lives right now. Do you know that? Do you understand that? Does it, does it resonate in your spirit? When it does, it drives you. It creates purpose in life. It helps us to define who we are as individuals. Even before the cross, Jesus was looking beyond the cross and the goal of the next goal, which was the third day. Which takes me down to the third observation, the final one. It's amazing how much is in these two passages in terms of concepts related to Christian ideas. It's the third observation is that there's something here that's really important about his second coming. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, look, your house is left to you desolate. Then verse 35 of Luke 13, you will, you will see me again, but not until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 118th Psalm again, verse 26. Now the question that is before us looking at this is this. Is what Jesus say, does what Jesus say in Luke 13, is it fulfilled in Luke 19? Because the people do say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, the problem is that there are some aspects of Luke 13 that are fulfilled in Luke 19. But, not at all. And the thing that's missing is this section on the destruction of Jerusalem. He says, in fact, the days are coming when there won't be one stone on another. And then it is after that destruction that the people will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So, what's Jesus saying here? He's saying one more time, the people are going to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's why Jerusalem is still such an important city in our world, because the people of Israel and the city of Jerusalem are tied to the events of Jesus' second coming. That's why we as Christians need to know what's happening in the nation of Israel. He comes first as a baby. He comes second time as king. Just this week, I uh, came across an article written by a dear friend, Dr. Howard Snyder, who was our anniversary speaker just in March. He's uh, been at Tyndale. He was at Tyndale as professor of uh, Wesley Studies for five years. Uh, he retired from Asbury and was bored, so came to Tyndale for five years. And now he's in Bristol, England for one semester uh, at uh, Trinity there as Trinity Scholar. I'm not sure exactly... Uh, the institution. Actually, maybe I do. He's at Trinity College, Bristol, England, as a Trinity World Fellow. Uh, again, his pen is such a powerful force, and he's been writing for 40 years now. And so he was asked in this article to give his observations uh, about, on the basis of 40 years of writing, give your reflections on what you see happening in the church. Seven reflections on 40 years of writing. I'm going to just whip through them real, real fast. Let's take Scripture seriously, unfiltered, without blinders, inductively, is the first one. Number two, the church is a spiritual social organism. Number three, God is always in the business of radically renewing the church if we are open to the Spirit and faithful to Scripture. Number four, and this is the one that really spoke to me as I wrote this message. God has a plan for the fullness of time to bring everything in heaven and earth together under one head, even Jesus Christ. God has a plan for the fullness of time to bring everything in heaven and earth together under one head, even Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 10. Christians are stewards of God's grace and stewards of the earth. We are in the we're the head of the parade when it comes to the uh, environmental movement. Number six, since God is always at work to renew the church, church history is largely the story of a succession of renewal movements from the early church right up to today, including Martin Luther, 1517. And then finally, this is again, just speaks to Dr. Snyder's 
wonderful heart, we have unbounded confidence that God will fulfill all his promises. God has a plan, and Jesus and Jerusalem are part of that plan to bring all things under his lordship. Well, I want to conclude with just a, a, a story. So what? So what? What does it mean to me today that Jesus and Jerusalem are incredibly tied together into biblical history and into world history? I think there's one thing that God would teach us from this passage of Scripture this morning. And they're tied to the three verses of Scripture that I've emphasized as I have read them. Luke 13, verse 34. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Is there ever a moment in my life when I'm not willing to receive what God has for me? Verse 42. If you had only known what, you would, what would bring you peace, do I really truly know what will bring me peace? Or am I looking in the wrong places, the wrong things for peace in my life? Number three, Luke 19, verse 44. Because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Is it possible that I could miss out on what God is doing in the world? that it could be right in front of me. I could be part of the triumphal entry and yet not see what God is doing. Be alert. Be alive to the fresh wind of the Holy Spirit because if we do miss out on God's acts in history, in our own personal history, there are consequences over which we have no control. You know, I haven't always done this well. In fact, there's lots of times in my life when I, I know I have missed what God was doing. But there's one moment that I believe God helped me in a very crucial moment in my life to really see what he was doing, which was way outside anything I'd ever experienced. I was at Roberts Wesleyan, fall of 75. I had been raised in rural Ontario in conservative free Methodism. And the one thing that rural free Methodism, conservative free Methodism feared more than anything else in the 1970s was the rise of the Pentecostal movement. I know that some of you went through those kinds of experiences where Pentecostalism was seen to be the enemy. Sadly, terribly sadly. But that's just the way it was in the 1970s. So I went to Roberts Wesleyan which, again, is not as conservative on that particular issue, but certainly still very conservative. And into my life come three people. We ended up calling them the three wise men. These three men uh, transferred from Robert, to Roberts Wesleyan from a little charismatic Bible school in Lima, New York, called Elam Bible Institute. <coughs> And I want to tell you, these guys were charismatic right through and through. They were as Pentecostal charismatic as you could get. If you wanted to be frightened by Pentecostals, then these three people were the people to stay away from. Well, those three, those three people really, boy, they, they knew God. And, and when they prayed, you were in, their, in the presence of the Holy One. You just knew that they were, they, it was genuine. Whatever they had, it was real. Those three men, one of them became my roommate, became later Dr. Jeffrey Altman, professor at Roberts Wesleyan. Second was a man named Ron Bartolo, who was a six foot five, this great big guy, and as Italian as you could get, and, and a charismatic Italian, you really want to watch out for those, let me tell you. So he ends up being a pastor at, in, in Buffalo, very, very, very fine ministry that he's had there over the years. 
The third was a man named Fred Adams. Well, you know the links between Fred Adams and this church. Mike and Bev spend a year with their kids with Fred and Barb in the Philippines. And Adam and Ashley are there right now. And God has done an incredible work. Uh, it's, it's a mystery to me how Fred Adams ever got into the Free Methodist Church. I'll never know that for sure. Somebody, somewhere in the, in the administrative, uh, they missed a cue because he just didn't fit all the characteristics. But somebody somewhere saw this man was also full of the Holy Spirit. And he's given all of his life, he and Barb have given all of their ministry to the Philippines. He's retiring in June of this coming year. Coming back to the States, and of course they'll be involved in their children and grandchildren's lives when they come back. That was one moment in my life when I realized that I had to go outside of my previous experience. And I had to let those three wise men, they were all older, they were all uh, quite a bit older actually. Fred will be 65 this coming year, and Jeff's already retired from Roberts. He's 66 or 67 this year. They were all a little bit older. They had a lot of life experience. Jeff, for example, his father was an Anglican minister, and his father had committed suicide. And so Jeff had gone through that horrendous experience. And he just, they, they just were wise, wise people and full of the Holy Spirit. And that, that was one moment in my life when I'm glad I laid aside all of my personal preferences and all of the categories that I had and said, Lord, I'm open to these three people being an influence in my life if that is your plan and purpose. See, I think that's what Jesus means in these passages of Scripture. I was doing something, people of Jerusalem, and you missed it. I am doing something, church, in the world today. Are you missing it? We get bogged down in the news of what's taking place in North America and Western Europe. I heard this week of a school that's uh, eliminated Operation Christmas Child because they learned that Franklin Graham was putting Gospel of John's in the shoeboxes. So that particular area of Ontario, school boxes, schools will not be doing Operation Christmas Child. I mean, we hear those kinds of stories, we're discouraged by them. But when we see what God is doing, when, as Dr. Snyder says, God has a purpose and a plan to bring all things under the authority of Christ, to bring justice in this world, when we see that part of the equation, then that gives us hope and that keeps us on track and it says, steady as we go. And if God brings new influences in my life that are going to send me in just a slightly different direction, but within the umbrella of his grace and within the umbrella of orthodoxy, then I have to be open to that in order that I may be a growing person so that I do not miss. I do not miss. They missed what would bring them peace. They missed what God was doing because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to thank you this morning for Fred and Barb and Jeff and Meredith, Ron and his wife, and uh, what you taught me about you through them almost 40 years ago. Thank you for Adam and Ashley and for their ministry. Thank you for the fact that Carol and Greg are going to get to join them for the month of December in that ministry in the Philippines. How grateful we are for that, too. Lord, I pray today that you would open our eyes to what you are doing in our world. And if it is just a little bit different than our comfort zone, than what we have experienced of you thus far, and Lord, I know how many times I've missed it too because of the fact that it was just not what I was used to. I pray, Father, that you would help us through Jesus' lament over Jerusalem to catch his heart, 
that, yeah, your purpose in the world from the very beginning of the church is to continually renew the church, and you will use any number of different ways to do that. May we be truly open to your Spirit's work. And when it's a little bit, when, when it's coloring outside the lines, we pray, Father, that you would help us, give us the courage. It takes courage to, to ebb and flow. And we just pray, Father, that you would help us to experience that courage, that grace that comes when we are fully committed to the Lordship of Christ, whatever the cost. Please stand with us as we sing. <clears throat> so many times in our lives when we miss what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing amongst us this morning. You are at work. You said that wherever you and your father were, you were always working. Lord, we want more than anything else to be exactly in the center of your will. We as a congregation come before you this morning with a heart of obedience, with a desire to serve, with a desire to be exactly what you called us to be. We know that 
every congregation in this city has a call, has a purpose. Just as you had a specific purpose, so this congregation has specific purpose. There are things that we do that enhance the life of the body of Christ in this city that no other congregation can do unless we're doing it and doing it well. So, Lord, we're open to your Holy Spirit's <coughs> direction and leadership. We believe that you have led us in the past. We, all, we haven't always caught it. We haven't always got it. But we thank you for the times when we did. And we're just saying, Lord, that that's, that's what we want in the future as well. We want what you want. We want you to be Lord of all. We do not want to come to the day of, of the reckoning and have you say, oh, you missed it. You didn't see what I was doing. We want you to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You did get it. You saw it. Lord, again, we just thank you for every person in this congregation today. And again, we thank you that every one of us has purpose and meaning in your kingdom. Be with the needs represented throughout the congregation at the altar this morning. Lord, again, we just lift Bonnie to you for the complete healing of her body. We pray for all those within the congregation who are going through uh, tests and are uh, going to be facing procedures in, in coming days. We pray, Lord, that you would be with those who are needing employment. We pray for those who are in places where employment is not at all secure. Lord, we pray for those who are buffeted by the winds of Hurricane Sandy even right now and pray that that hurricane will be less, its impact will be less than what is currently being said. We pray for all the people um, in, our, in our world that are going through, we think of Haiti again and, and wonder how much more this poor country can take. <laughs> We ask for Syria and what's going on in the Middle East. And again, the ancient rivalries and hatreds are still there. And, and Jesus, we just pray that you, the Prince of Peace, will break down those hatreds. We ask for the city of peace, Jerusalem, and pray for its safety. May all who enter there be secure. So, Lord, our, our lives are yours. We're ready to do what you've called us to do. As we leave this place now, we ask that we would go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.